Thank you. Right. Um, so, my name is Yvonne Howard, and I'm here today with Pat McSweeney and Andy Day, and we can, we're from the CSC Southampton. So, over the few years, what we've been doing is looking at usable repositories, mostly for teaching and learning materials. We got quite excited about this a um, few years back and saw lots of teaching and learning repositories that weren't very usable. So we sat back and thought, well, what can we do about this? How can we make them so much better? And we came up with things like EdShare, with Humbox, the Language Box, Loro, and lots of other things that are now out there. Okay. And then we thought, well, it's not just teaching and learning repositories. There are other ones that, could deserve, that deserve that kind of attention. So then we started thinking about scholarly discourse. So what could we do with what we've learned in some of our other things to support scholarly discourse as well? Um, at the minute, I think we do have a bit of a problem with it. And Jeff Haywood was starting to talk about that in the welcome speech, wasn't he? He talked about what it was like when scholars, 200 of them, in the Royal Society got together in a room and talked about their stuff and where they had trusted relationships. And that research area was a very tight community where people knew what was going on, where everybody knew what was new, where that, uh, the letters between them, the discourse between them, was very easy to follow. And in fact, it wasn't that much different when you got to, let's say, 1935. Still a print medium. Still mostly the scholars really getting together. But... Since we've had the internet and we've had open access and we've got lots more digital resources, things have really changed. So what is scholarly discourse now? Well, in fact, it's in colour, is one thing. Um, but what it does mean, we have some information locked away in um, journals you subscribe to. There are lots more open access journals there are repositories sitting in people's institutional repositories. Lots of research there. Uh, student theses. Uh, Dojo projects. Lots and lots of other information that's digitally available or digitally there but not really available. And the discourse happens differently. If you have as many journals, as many articles that are being published as there are, it isn't just that small group in a room. It's conferences all around the world. It's people getting together. And the other thing that we really find is that, yes, you have the article that gets put in a repository, that gets published through a journal, but a lot of what happens is ephemeral. The discourse is ephemeral. So when two people get together at a conference and talk about their research, gone. The PowerPoint slides I put here that may get put up on the uh, conference website, essentially ephemeral, they're gone. When you look, tweet possibly about this, if you're excited enough about it, um, that will disappear. As will a blog article somebody writes. Because it's not connected back with the actual research artefact. So it's ephemeral. It's not connected anymore. It's not all in that one room. So what can we start to think about it? Well, one thing is very clear, and something that we thought with teaching learning materials, there's a life cycle going on. They're not static. It's fluid. It's dynamic. So... People like us researchers, we get inspired for our ideas from the world. And we do some stuff up in the cloud, and we make new research, which people publish, and that falls onto the rest of the world, which then again inspires us to make new things. But it's dynamic. So a piece of research isn't stuck in aspect. There's a discourse around it, which means that I, the ideas it generates change, that it gets reused in different ways. Okay, so they do have a living life cycle. So how can we start to support that within a scholarly discourse idea? So, at the minute, mostly what we think about repositories is that, you know, they're for archiving. They keep things nice and safe. They keep them permanently in an official way. They're PDFs mostly. They're curated and monitored, which is really good because we need that to happen. But what about supporting that living life cycle? What can we do that could be different? Okay. So, are scholarly works different from teaching learning materials that we made really exciting? Probably not. So, can we apply what we knew, what we learned from doing EdShare? So, what if we had a research repository that started to 
capture that discourse? What do we want to have in it? We'd want the archiving, because that's really important, but we'd want more than just the article as a PDF. We'd want to have the data about it. We'd want to capture that discourse. And also to help recapture some of those trust relationships that Jeff was talking about earlier, because everybody was in the same room. How do you create the trust in the researcher? How do you show their digital presence? How do you help showcase interesting and valuable research? So we thought, well, what can we do about that? What have we learned that we can help with? So we can help syndicate new research. We can showcase researchers. We can give really good attention metadata so people can work out in a particular strand what's hot, what's new, what's important, what's having an effect. And we can start to capture that commentary. And we want to do it in a nice, engaging way, like we did with EdShare, where things are engaging. Okay, so what we did was we hosted stuff. Not just metadata about stuff, we hosted the stuff so you can see it with an inline preview. Capturing the discourse, capturing commentary about it. And also that idea of having a digital presence, a place where you start to build trust in the research because you can learn about them, what else they've done and what's happening with their stuff. Okay. And the other things that have been going on, of course, with EdShare, we really use what was going to Web2 worlds that's actually built deeply within what we did with EdShare, the idea that things are deeply linked. Okay. But there's more stuff going on now. We've got new formats. How many people here have got iPads? Quite a few, I think. Most, lots of people have got iPhones. There are really good ways now of carrying with you ways you can look at digital information. So people have come out with floods, they've been coming out with pulse from the iPad, there's Flipboard, lots of really nice ways of producing really engaging things for people to read. And that's um, using the RSS web, um, using RSS. There's nothing you know, really clever about it, it's just using RSS. And it's based, all of these things with Flipboard and Pulse and whatever are based on using um, syndicated RSS and Twitter fees and other information. But there's a thing, isn't there? Um, one of the things we learned through all our history of doing teaching and learning repositories is that the stuff that us geeks like can be quite different from what's acceptable to other people. It actually raises barriers for other people when we get a bit geeky. They just think we're a bit old, really. Um, so if you say RSS to somebody, this is the kind of comment you get back. And these are real comments. We tried it out because EdShare has been able to, um, has an RSS feed. Uh, we use it internally to support other repositories and talk to them. But the take-up of RSS feeds from our teaching and learning repositories was very low. And we didn't know why. So we asked people. And they said, oh, heard of RSS, but it's for you geeks, isn't it? I wouldn't know what it's for or what to do with it. And then somebody said, oh, I've used RSS and I just got all this stuff. And I just turned it off. But they all said, oh, Twitter? Oh, I really like that. I use it all the time. You think, it's not so different. So what is the difference? The fact that Twitter is accessible and easy to use and you can't see the plumbing underneath. Okay, so if we take all of those ideas, what would we come up with? Our very first step in making the idea of um, starting to support that scholarly discourse. So if you're an, inst an institution and you have a repository of really good research, how can you publish it? How can you take all of those materials and make them easily available in these novel publishing formats and also capture some of that scholarly discourse as well? And give tool the tools for people to manage that publication, but also tools for people to be able to see those, those um, novel publication formats. And that's Campus Raw, which is kindly funded by GISC, as all the other things have been. So, this is where we get to the repository fringe, where there's always a bit of online stand up, you know, real life stand up. So, this is the real life stand up. So, we brought jokers out at this point. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, this is Pat McSweeney, in case you don't know, and this is Andy Day, who's uh, working with us over the summer. So, over to you guys. Right, so we're just going to be really quick because we're aware that we're already on some lunch. Um, basically, Andy's an intern for us. He's some of the latest and greatest talent coming out of ECS. And he's been looking at how we could make, for these iPad apps and iPhone apps and things like that, how we can make more digestible content 
in personalized magazine formats, and how we can make news that comes out of your repositories more engaging. And so we did a little bit of a study that looked at what makes a good personalized magazine feed, and we've made an ePrint plugin uh, which you can now install on the bazaar, uh, from the Bazaar, if anyone's got ePrint 3.3, if you don't, come talk to me afterwards, um, which makes your research look more attractive in a personalized magazine. Uh, but we also moved on to, well, maybe we could do this more generally for an entire campus, or even, in fact, for all the campuses in the UK. And so Andy's been working on a tool which lets you build a customised feed about academic news in your area. Andy, do you want to just... Yep. Know, okay, so basically what it does is you get a spider, a web spider, it crawls a university web space and pulls all the feeds it can find off of it. It uh, puts them in a database, it works out all the keywords for every single item or document it, it can find. Um, then user can input their own keywords, like their interests, their areas of research, and then it outputs a customised feed uh, based on their keywords. So you don't get all the stuff you don't want, you just get what you're interested in. Okay, I'm going to do a quick demo and show you what you can do. So, science keywords coming up, sorry. Yeah, so say I'm, I'm, I've come here, so I'm interested in repositories. Uh, and one. We aren't doing anything too clever with stemming yet, but we will in the future. It's worth mentioning, by the way, if you so at the moment we've got Edinburgh campus uh, crawled, we've got Glasgow campus crawled because it was appropriate to here, and Southampton campus. And we threw in a couple of uh, couple of key repositories as well, but we're open to expanding the data source. So if you're interested in having your campus news managed through this, then please do come speak to us. Yep. Uh, so we were interested in those things because we're here. So we press feed me. We get a little preview, and we get an RSS feed, which is all about what we've asked for. So all sorts of related and things. It's worth noting that this feed is kind of specially designed so that if you import it into Flipbook or Pulse or something like that, then you do get quite a nice dynamic little magazine come out of it rather than uh, a lame, lame yeah. sort of traditional RSS feed from an inference repository. Um, we do have an iPad floating around if you guys want to come have a play later. Um, and the website exists, panfeed.ecs.com.ac um, and we'll be around. We're going to give a Petra Kutcher in more detail than this, believe it or not, um, <laughs> tomorrow. Okay. I think that's it. Thank you yep. very much. So this is just for the guys at the end. Uh, I just missed a bit. Is it just limited to your institution, or can you set it up so it pulls from every... thinking that it'd be better not to limit it to get... Well, on. I think it's important to have the option to limit it. For example, if you're the comms department at the University of Southampton and you've got absolutely no way of controlling all the academics that are blogging on your campus and you've got no way of knowing what's going on because you don't really have any good systems for managing this and many resources, you kind of want to be able to see only your own university's news so you can handpick from that what's relevant to you and what you might want to do extended articles on and put on the front page of the university website and etc, etc, etc. So there are some use cases for wanting to filter it down. But in general, I agree with you. I like the wider, the wider news spectrum. Also, probably uh, uh, a uh, university isn't the internet easy as it sounds. So it's quite hard. So it does take time to do the university. So you can't just say, oh, I'm going to go. So one of the other... <laughs> yeah, so one of the other things is that that's one of the, one of the tools that are going to be part of this, this set of campus rule. The other part is the Prince Publisher, which is something that allows people to, as an institution to self-publish their archive journals. Uh, the pan feed is what a user might do to put their feeds together. Um, we're going to be distributing through Prince Bazaar as an Prince Bazaar package, so um, you know, where are you going to read your daily Prince? <laughs>
Okay. Yeah, that's 